deals with the Shulchan. According to the Rambam, vessels of the Beis Hamikdash are a part of the Beis Hamikdash. They were not counted as a separate mitzvah. There's no mitzvah that you have to make a menorah, a shulchan, a kiyar. But it says to make a house for Hashem, that's included since the house of Hashem, according to the Rambam, is to serve Hashem. So everything that is a part of serving Hashem becomes a part of that mitzvah. According to the others who count the enumerated mitzvahs, they will uh, enumerate the menorah as one mitzvah, and shulchan another mitzvah. So according to the Rambam, it's all a part of the so, paragraph 12, chapter 3, Ashulchan. You come to the table, was 12 handbreadths long, and its width was 6 handbreadths. So, how was it in the base of Migdash? It was along the length of the northern wall. Instead of being from north to south, you know, from, uh, instead of being from east to west, it was on the northern wall going from east to west. It was going from east to west, going along the, lo- the length of the, of the wall. The other vessels in the base of Mikdash, it was the length with the cordial the length of the Beis HaMikdash, and the width was according to the width of the Beis HaMikdash, the oven was an exception, its length was, was according to the width of the Beis HaMikdash, and therefore we have this in our diagram. So we have the diagram, we have the Aron, which is we are going along the width of the Beis HaMikdash. Its length went from north to south, and the width was from east to west. And then also the chain, Neira Samaneira, also the lights of the Meneira, Neged Reich Babais was also going along the width of the base of Mikdash, Ben Tzapan, Ben Dorum, going from north to south. So here we have the Ben where we explained last week that the wicks on the northern side were going towards the center, the wicks on the southern side were going towards the center, and the center was the Ne'er was the western light, because that was facing towards Kaidish HaKadoshim, towards the west, where Kaidish HaKadoshim was situated. There was also a special miracle that took place with the central light. The Neram the same amount of oil was placed in all of the lamps. The Neram that continued to burn constantly. And then they would light from the Neram the additional lights, and then they would, at uh, that moment, they would be extinguished and then be lit again. That was the, <clears throat> that was a testimony that the Shekhinah is resting with cloud and soil. Now we turn to 13, which is after 15, in the handout that we have. Thirteen. Now the Rambam is going to describe how the table is actually functional. We know that there were the twelve loaves, six in each arrangement, and they were placed. The six were placed one on top of another. Now, in order to give it support, it should not to go to either side of the table. So then there had to be something to support them. So we are now going to speak about the supports. And the Rambam calls them here in the translation, it's called side frames. 
There were four side frames of gold. They were split on top. They were used to support the two arrangements of the Lechem Aponim. Two of the supports were on one side for the arrangement of the six. The other two were the, for the other six. In the Torah, they are called Kisaisov. That is the description. So when we look at the diagram that we have on, uh, on uh, 15, you will see the frames on both sides. Let's just look at the diagram on 15. So we see the two frames that are on both sides. They are number B, those are the side frames. Then we'll also have rods that are placed between each of the showbreads. So those little circles between are golden rods that were cut in half. And that is for the circulation of air between each of the loads. So let's see number 14. Shmaina, the Eskin of there were 28 rods of gold. Each one was resembled the half of a hollow reed. 14 for one arrangement, 14 for the other arrangement. They are called the Torah Manaki Yosef, that they are uh, given opportunity for the air to circulate. Then, and there were two cups, bowls. In them they were placed the spice, which is called frankincense, ala shulchan, it's placed near the arrangements of the of the showbread. In the Torah they are called kapoisa. So <clears throat> the two bowls of frankincense was that which was actually placed on the altar. And the Ramam is going to tell us that the Lechem Aponim was baked on Friday. It was not baked on Shabbos nor Yantar. It was baked on Friday. The Ramam is going to tell us where they placed them on Friday after they were baked. And then they were placed on the table on Shabbos itself. And when they place them, since it says Lechem upon upon I told me, they should constantly be the Lechem upon him, the showbread should be on the table constantly. So you had four Koyanim who were going to take, two of them would hold the arrangements of the current week. And two of them would be taking the arrangement of the past week. And as they're placing it, they would be moving it as they're coming to the table. They would be, the ones who were on the other side would be pulling them away. And as they're pulling them away, they would be replaced with the new ones. And then they would take them. And now the new ones were on the place of the table. They were put simultaneously, two, two groups of toilet would replace the lechem upon him of the past week and bring in the current. And then they would remove the bowls of incense that was taken to the altar, the outside altar. And once, now the Rambam is going to tell us what they did with the lechem upon him, the showbread, they placed it on a table in the foyer, the entranceway of the Beis Hamikdash. That was placed there until the incense was brought. And then the lechem upon him was distributed among the Kayanim. So let's see what uh, goes in. So, but what's over here, the Rambam is identifying the different vessels that were used on the table. Since the Torah gives them specific names, the Rambam is identifying them according to the names that the Torah gives them. 
But Muslims show Isa Ben Lechem upon him. Then there were also forms, molds, in which Lechem upon him were, were baked. They might claim Kavaisov, they are called Kavaisov. The plates. So we're going to be learning where specifically the Lechem upon him was baked. There's a special chamber that was for the baking of the Lechem upon him. And the uh, ones who were baking the lechem upon him, they came from a family that were experts in being able to bake the lechem upon him in such a way that they should be able to hold their form without crumbling. Now, let's continue in 15. Now, the Ramam tells us in 15, Elaba Asa Kanim, the 14 rods, were placed as following. The first of the Lechma Ponim was placed on the surface of the table itself. There was no separation between the Lechma Ponim and the first of the Lechma Ponim on the table. And then they placed the second one on top of the first that was on the table, Shlesha Kanim, three rods. So golden rods, they have uh, rods. Between each of the Chala was Shlesha Kanim, three rods. Between Shishis the Chamishis from the very top, which is between the fifth and the sixth, Shnei Kanim Bilvad, there were two rods instead of three. Since the sixth was the very top one, and therefore it did not have that much weight as the others. For every arrangement, there were 14 rods. So the, uh, each of the lechem upon him weighed approximately seven and a uh, half pounds. It would double of the shield for a dough that was used for challah. So each one was about seven pounds. And then... Um, each showbread was seven pounds, rather? Yes. You double the size of amount of dough that, that, uh, that gets the separation of power. Yeah, so the double. Itself, like 60 pounds. So that's right. And it was thin. No, it wasn't thin. Yeah. No, well, it wasn't thin. It wasn't, it wasn't much. It was like, a, it was like more like... A, like a pita, you know, like a, it was a, it was a, so what? But he didn't, so you rolled it out, you didn't, you didn't, you baked it before it had a chance to rise, and you had a heavy dough. Yeah. Oh, not hmm. It was a special, uh, it, it, was, it was, in the times when the Jewish people deserved it, it was miraculous. No matter how small of a piece of kayin got, it was filling at a full meal. And another miracle that took place was they baked it on Friday. They put it into the, uh, the place on Migdash on Shabbos. It stayed there a whole week. At the end of the week on Shabbos, when they were removing the lechem upon him to give it to the Kayanim, it was still hot as it came out of the oven. It was still steaming. It was still steaming. The Pasuk tells us that uh, it was lechem chayim. It was bread that was still hot. And that's the description that they give of lechem upon in Tanakh. So, so you have now the 14 rods for each arrangement. And the Rambam continues in 16. There were two tables in the entrance hall near the entrance of the temple building. So um, what we have so this we have the, the, the model of the of the base Hamigdash. We have the way it's here, it's not according to the Rambam, this is according to the other function. 
we do have that there was the two chambers. You had Kodesh HaKadoshim, Holy of Holies, the inner chamber. And then you had Kodesh, Holy, in which there was the menorah and the shulchan and the golden Mizbeach. And then there was an ulam, an entranceway. So this was not a part of the Kodesh and Kodesh HaKadoshim. Kodesh HaKadoshim was 20 Amis long. Kodesh was 40, together was 60. And then you had the Ulam, the entranceway. So with the Ulam, the entranceway, as soon as you came in, there was a table on one side and a table on the other side. And he tells us what was the material of which the table was made. Echad Shul Shayish. One was made of marble. On Friday, after it was baked, they would place it on the marble table. Another table on the other side was of gold. That was when the arrangement was removed from the table and the new one was placed it, that was placed on the golden table. When it comes to holiness, you keep going up, and you do not descend. Therefore, since all week it was on the golden table, so therefore when they removed it, they also placed it on a golden table. And after the Levina, after the incense was brought on the altar, then it was distributed to the Kayanim. And on Shabbos, there were the Kayanim from the past week who did the Avaida, and there were also Kayanim for the coming week. So they would divide it accordingly to the Now, what happened on Friday? When they brought the new arrangement, they placed it on the marble table. They then removed all of the rods from between the lechem upon it. So we have now the bottom one is carrying how much a weight of? About seven, huh? about seven pounds. So how much is the bottom one carrying? Seven times five, 35 pounds. So the bottom one is carrying, so even though all week it, there were rods that were separating them and they were on the supporting table that they, they, they didn't carry the full weight, still one on Shabbos carried the full weight and the lechem upon him kept its shape. It did not crumble. So the one, the bakers from the special, special family of Garmo, they were the ones who knew how to bake it in a special way, it should be able to hold the shape, to be able to take the weight, and to be able to be functional in the Beis HaMikdash. So they asked them to tell the secrets of how it's made that way. No one was able to duplicate it. So they said they refused to divulge the secret. And they said, okay, we'll get replacements. The Bakers who were most famous at that time were bakers from Alexandria, Egypt. They had very, they were, they were exclusive in, 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 in being bakers. Therefore, they were Jewish. Uh, there was a big population in Alexandria in the times of, um, it was at one point there was a million people, a million Jewish people living in Alexandria, Egypt. They had such a big shul that um, it was a, Everyone davened together. It was also divided according to professions. Everyone had their profession that they had a special section. So the people could sort of uh, converse with each other and sort of catch up on you know, what's happening in the, in the market. But anyway, they weren't able to, the chazan had to be someone with some voice, but uh, they did not rely on that, but they actually had flags that when it came time to say amen, they had the amen flag, you know, which where you're up to in davening. So they had these, he says, but anyway, so they got the bakers from Alexandria and they tried their very best, but they failed. So they called back to the family of Garmo. They told them that they're going to, uh, they, they want to rehire them again and um, they'll double their salary. And they asked, why did you not want to divulge the secret? He said, this is a secret that's been ha handed down generation to generation. And it was meant to be exclusively used for the base Hamikdash. It's been already prophesied that the base Hamikdash is going to be destroyed. The secret is going to be divulged. Who is going to be, the, what is going to be done with the secret? They're going to use it 
for other purposes. Therefore, the family has such a, that they keep it only exclusively for the Beis Amigdash. They'll never ever use this type of baking other than the Lechem Afan. So that is the, uh, now, according to Hasidus, why were the rod, what, what was the purpose of the rods to begin with? And why on Shabbos were the rods removed? And also the sidebars also were not needed. And, uh, and then my mom explains that the source of the lechma ponim was of wheat. Source of wheat is from kochma, the highest level of the 10 spivas. So the wheat is from kochma. And as you've learned, when it comes to the spivas, in order to bring it down a level, you have to go from Chachma to Bina. Chachma is only the flash. Bina is the, 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 the explanation and, and elaborating it until you want to understand it. So the purpose of the Lechem upon him was to bring down the Hashpa of Mazinus, the Hashpa of, of, of sustenance in all matters of the physical needs that came through the Lechem upon him. The same as was with the man that representing the man, which was also a heavenly food, but also sustained the Jewish people for 40 years. So now it was through the lechem upon him. The fact that there was lechem upon him, that brought prosperity to the whole world. And as described in, um, in the lochem, Shlem HaMelech had 10 additional tables. The lechem upon him was only placed on one, Maishan Abedin's table. But why was there additional tables to bring down sustenance in a very bountiful measure? So the table itself was also a conduit for, for plenty. So on, through the week, the actual hashpa came through Bina. The Bina has through Chesed and Bula. And then there is Netzach and Hayd. So that's where we have the different parts of the shulchan correspond to that. So you have 14 in each arrangement. How much is 14 in Hebrew? Uh, uh, 10 is how much? Yud. Dalit. Yud Dalit. What is Yud Dalit? Yeah. Yud Dalit is hand. So you have the right hand, you have the left hand. That said, Bula, developing the Lechma Ponim. It should come down through Chesed and Bula, it should come down until it comes down to the world. Then you have the two sidebars that are holding it up, Netzach and Haid. Keep it going down. On Shabbos, everything was elevated. So where does it go back to? Go back to Chachma. So you take away the Raza Bina, you take with the Yudalit, you take it away. Because you don't, you're not, it's not going through Bina anymore. Take away the sidebars because everything is going directly through Chokhmah. And Chokhmah at that time is the world itself is getting such a sustenance that's coming through the highest level <coughs> as Shabbos elevating the entire world. So this is also that we have the um, Lechma Ponim with a conduit for Kedusha for the whole world, and we were able to do so. Now by our Shabbos, Shabbos Chalas, and then we also have that which we also make a bracha before we eat, that empowers us, that we should be able to elevate the sparks that are in the foods, and um, the foods, the sparks come from a very high level, that's higher than the world of Tikkun, comes from Toyo, the world where it's a, a world of a very, very intense, high level of kedusha of light. And um, that is so intense that it cannot come down directly to the world. It had to come through the shattering of the vessels, came down to the world. Now we have to be the ones who are going to lift up those sparks, bring them to kedusha. How could we lift up such sparks? So we make a bracha. Bogo is to bring down godliness, Ata, speaking directly to Hashem, as he is without any description, you, 
Hashem, UK Bobke, is Hashem is higher than time and place. Past, present, and future, it's all one. And all of this is Elokeinu, our God, that we are the conduit that is going to receive all of this godliness. And now we are now empowered with this high level of Kedusha, Atta, Hashem, Elokeinu, our power now. Melech HaElam, to us, we bring this sustenance, we bring this godliness to the whole world. So we are, when, when we make a bracha, we are empowered. We are connected to Hashem in this most miraculous, uh, an amazing way. That we now become the conduit for Kedusha for the entire world. And then we make the bracha of concluding whatever Hamaytzi left in the And um, Hamaytzi said, we're holding every other food, we hold it in our dominant hand when we make the bracha. When it comes to Hamaytzi, we hold it with all 10 fingers, representing 10 spheres that we are bringing down when we make the Hamaytzi. And um, then um, and we eat it, it becomes part of us as we are at the level of Kedusha. Then also when it comes to benching, we take all the sparks that we have received. If it is a Kazayas, at least the Kazayas, then we're able to elevate them. They go to their source. Less than a Kazayas, it's, you don't have enough fuel power to, to make it rise. So we don't make a Blokach. A Blokach, the first block we make for every, no matter how small amount of food we eat. So um, now we come to Yud Zion 17. The incense altar, Amal Ama, was one cubit by one cubit square. Now the Rambam is going to tell us where it was. It was in the center between. North and south, Moshe ben Ashulchan Amaneva Lachutz. It was not aligned with the Shulchan Amaneva on a straight line, but rather more towards the entrance way. All three of these vessels were in the inner third of the sanctuary, facing the Kavaychis. Curtain that's separated between Kaidish and Kaidish and Kaidish. So we have this, uh, we have a diagram. We should have something. There was a diagram of this right there. Yes, there is. On page 67, when we started off with the Shulchan, there was a diagram that we have how they were um, placed. We have, it comes out like a saddle. We have the Shulchan and the menorah are Closer into the Hegel towards Kodesh Hakadoshim, and then we have the Zbeya Hazal, the golden altar that was between the two, centered in the center of the of, of the Hegel. Now, um, the golden altar was used twice a day. The incense incense were brought on the altar. The fire that was used was taken from the Mizbeya. On the Mizbeach were three different wood piles. There was, on the eastern side was the main one that was used for all the components, all the sacrifice. Then there was one on the western side. The western side was specifically used to take the coals of the, from that wood pile, and that was used to light the Incense was brought into on the golden altar. So there's a special taken from a special coal that were specifically uh, burnt for that purpose. 
Also, in case the menorah had to be lit, they also would use that, those coals on the coals that were on the, the uh, western side, closest towards the base of Mikdash. Then there was a third wood pile, and that was since it says, Eish Tomatu Hil Amitbeh Leisich Bet, it should be constantly a fire burning on the Mitzvah, it should never be extinguished. It was just, its purpose was never used, it was just always burning, fire always burning, as never to be extinguished. The, um, on, on Yom Kippur, so then the golden altar, the uh, bloods that were brought inside, uh, or, 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 or were placed on, on the on the Tavichis, were also placed on the four corners of the golden altar. And also seven times, seven sprinklings were done on the center of the well, So it was used for Yom Kippur, for the sacrifice. And throughout the year, it was for Ketavis, the incense. And um, it says that the incense was such power that no one needed any perfume. It was a very, very pleasant, extremely pleasant scent. And was permeated the whole of Yerushalayim. Again, we have the outer Mizbeach and the inner Mizbeach. So we have the outer Mizbeach, which is to elevate the Vedas uh, Abbe from the, that which is the worldly things to take out, extract the, uh, the godly sparks. And then we have the, uh, the um, golden Mizbeach that represents the inner heart, and that is connected to of Kedusha, of uh, elevating Kedusha itself to higher levels. So we have the elevation of the worldly things, of the outside Mitzvah, and the inside Mitzvah, but for Kedusha itself, go higher and higher, never being satisfied the level that we're at. Number 18, Hakia, Hayalai, Shneimas, Adad, Hakia, the fountain, I call it a fountain. So it had 12 horses. They yield kolakainim aiskim, the tomid, the kachim imenaka echod, 12 kainim who were occupied in the daily sacrifice could all sanctify their hands and feet at the same time, as we explained that the kainim also walk barefooted and they had to sanctify both that which came in contact with the holy ground of the base of English, which was a marble, and also their hands, they were going to do the Abba Yadah. The um, Kiel had also a base. So Kiel and Kanai, so Kiel represents Torah, the Kanai is the base that represents the ones who were supporting Torah. And the place where it was, it, its place was on the left side, near the entranceway of the of the of the base of Migdash, near the entrance hall, on the left side, which is on the southern side, near the mitbeach, near the altar. And then the Rambam tells us, they made a mechanism, Shiba Ayim Tamid, it should constantly be water, the it was ordinary. The waters were not, it was not, the vessel was not sanctified. Now, the halacha is that if something is placed in a sanctified vessel, if it stays overnight in this vessel, it becomes disqualified. Also, Bolina, staying overnight disqualifies it, whether it was foods that were, or uh, in this case, we're speaking about the water. The water would be left in the kia and would overnight, the water would remain there. So the next morning, they would have to empty it out and discard that water, even though the waters themselves were holy waters. Since the vessel itself, the kia, the basin was sanctified, any water that was placed inside became sanctified as well. So how do they deal with this in order that there should not be any waters that will have to be discarded, taking the waters that were sanctified and then just throwing them out? We're trying to avoid that. So 
every coin that was going to do the avoider in the Beis Amigdosh had to sanctify his hands and feet. How many coin were going to be? As many as were needed. So let's say you had 100,000 people who were bringing carbonus that day. So you have to have kayanim they were going to be able to serve them. So now you need an abundance of kayanim that are going to be using the keel before they're going to do the avayda, they're going to be washing their hands and feet. In addition to the 12 or the, that were doing the avayda in the morning. So how do you do that? So therefore they had another source of water and that was attached to the kia, and, it was, and, and they had a plug in between. So they, it was a, a reservoir of water, and according to how much water was needed, when they saw that there were many kind that were going to be using the kia, they would open up, they take away the plug, more water would come in, according to how much they estimated would actually have to be used. So, they, so therefore it was regulated how much water would be in the kia at any time, trying to avoid having any water to remain overnight. Then at another point in the in time, they also opened up in the floor of the Beis Migdash next to the Kia, the, there was a water flowing underneath the, the floor of the Beis Migdash as we spoke by the, by the Mizbeach. There was when the bloods were placed on the altar, when there was a, a, a water that would a, a, a channel of water that would remove the, the blood, taking it to, to uh, outside of the Beis Hamikdash. So there was also a water that was constantly flowing. Now, if the kia was attached to flowing water, submerged there, so then it is not staying overnight because it's attached to its source. So they had two ways of trying to preserve the water. Firstly, they tried to limit how much water was going to be in the kia to begin with. Secondly, if there was any water left, what they would do is before the night would come, they would submerge it into that with another mechanism into that water source. That itself was coming from a spring. So that's constantly attached to its source. So then the water that were in the keel were attached to its source. It did not become disqualified because it was connected to the spring waters. Just like you have a mikvah, you have the outer of outer pool is where you could, you could put in fresh water, but you constantly have to have that connected to rainwater. So the same idea was also you're going to connect the kia to rainwater. So uh, so that's why the Rambam starts off with Mukhni Hayaloi, there was a mechanism showing by Maim Tome, there was a constantly water, Mahu Khail, that was ordinary. Actually, a Maim Shabam, if Solomalina, in its source. It was not sanctified, so if it stayed overnight, it did not become disqualified because it was not waters that were sanctified. And, and, and the mechanism itself that it's not sanctified, since the kia, the basin was of the holy and the basin, anything that was sanctified in the holy vessel, in lawn, if it stayed overnight, it became disqualified. Any questions on this? We have here um, another another description of how the sidebars were together with the um, with the shulchan. This is the one that was with Moshe Rabbeinu, so it actually had the staffs, it had the poles in order to be able to transport it. And when they transported the shulchan, the lechem upon him remained on it. Fall off when they're walking. So they, yeah. in the in the Vishkan, they were constantly carrying the shulchan with it, with the lechem upon. They did not remove it, but it was always kept together. Uh -huh. What shape was the shulchan? Uh -huh. What shape was the shulchan? Oh, it shows you. Uh, it, it came. The the description that they have over here. We have a picture. Page from page um, seventy-one, we have a picture of it having two sides. Lechem upon him was was that you were able to see 
one person to the other. In other words, it didn't have four sides. Two sides were, only it had two sides. The other two sides were, were, were flat, were, was flat and you were able to see the person on the other side. So you were able to, or panim means that each faced each other. So um, in, the, in this description, you actually folded it over in a greater extent. So again, according to different opinions of, uh, in the Gemara itself, there are also two opinions. Was it boat shaped or was it flat on the bottom? Two opinions about that. So, um, mm-hmm. You have to come from the family of a girl to be able to know how to make it properly. Huh? Okay, we're going to now go to the next chapter. Let's see what um, Jeski. Left to us, chapter five. I guess we'll go to chapter five. We assume that we have. So, here is um, the hand up for five, and uh, chapter five deals with the layout of the Beis Hamikdash, the courtyard, rather than the building itself. Building itself is described in chapter four with also the Oron. The Oron is a mitzvah on its own, the Rambam counted as a, as a separate mitzvah. Its purpose was to bring holiness into the Beis HaMikdash. It was not used for any service. So therefore it is a mitzvah. It's not one of the vessels of the Beis HaMikdash. It's, it's a separate entity on its own. And um, the Rambam tells us that um, the Shlema Melech built the Beis HaMikdash, the first Beis HaMikdash. He knew that it was going to be destroyed, therefore, he built a special chamber that when the time comes, it will be secreted there and is there for this very, until this very day. There was a uh, uh, Wendell, Wendell Jones. He said that he has the uh, copper scrolls and he was able to figure out from the copper scrolls where the ark is. And one tissue above, he said he was going to reveal the ark with the Luchais, but at the end, Tisha B'Av passed and he did not reveal anything. I, it was, I don't think it was meant to be revealed at this time. The best they would do with it is put it in the museum. I don't think Hashem wants the Lucas <laughs> to be in, in the great, in the great uh, museum of... Uh, <laughs> so it is holy and it's, uh, it is secreted there to this very, this very day. In other words, if the oven has to be in the base of Mikdash. It could be in one of two ways in the revealed chamber, or in the secret chamber, and that gives it the holiness for all the time. Beis HaMikdash still has its holiness, Yerushalayim has its holiness, the Lucas and the Oven are still intact in the site of the Beis HaMikdash. So then the Rambam also speaks about the, uh, this is what the Rambam uh, says, and also you speak, in, in chapter four is described the actual structure of the Beis HaMikdash and all the dimensions of it is. But right now we're going to speak about the Temple Mount, the gates, and the structure of the Beis Hamikdash itself, the uh, courtyards, and everything else. So let me, uh, in order to do so, let's have little handouts. I want to uh, sort of have the perspective of when, when people, has everyone been by the Kaislam Avavi, the Western Wall, sort of to have a perspective on what we're teaching now in reference to um, the Harabayas. And uh, let me send it, let me take this. Another, um, another handout. And so let's look to see where this handout is. Look, look at the, uh, the second handout that I've given. So you see there's, it's, there's, 
east and west, north and south. So if we look at the um, Beis Amigdash, that's in the center, we'll see that it's closest to the north. It's closest to the west. Closest to the west. And that is the outside wall. This is the, this is the wall that surrounds Arabias, surrounds the Temple Mount, the whole mountain. So therefore, this is the wall. When we look at the Western Wall, it would be you place it at the, place it at the west of the uh, of the pound that, that I gave you, and then you'll see where it is in, in relationship to the Beis Hamikdash itself, to Kedesh Chakadosh. So the Kedesh Chakadosh was on the western side of the temple structure, and so you see, you, are you relating the picture with the handout that I gave you? Are you able to, to visualize the two? So you're standing actually, when we're standing at the western wall, we are facing toward the Beis Hamikdash. We're facing towards Kedesh HaKadosh, Holy of Holies. Do you see it? Holy of Holies is this instrument. We could also have this one together with it. This I gave out last time. But that maybe it's easier to see it here. Kedesh HaKadosh, Holy of Holies. You have the Western Gate. That is the wall of the Temple Mount. It's not the wall of the Beis Hamikdash. It's not the wall of the of the uh, Azava of the of the uh, courtyard. This is past the courtyard. But the picture that you see that I gave you, the, the one that has the English in it, that is the wall is the wall of the courtyard, not of the Western Wall that we are having now with the Kaisla Malavi. So the Kaisla Malavi is more connected. To this picture, where this is it's this wall over here, which is Western Wall, closest to the Beis Hamikdash. Okay. Oh, so the Koisel is this. Who's the Koisel? Yeah. yeah, that's the Koisel. Where it says Kiponus Gates, yeah. that's the Koisel. So now let's go to the Rambam. Harabayas, the Temple Mount, Ruhar Maria, it is Mount Maria. Maria means comes from there comes all the teachings to Klal Yisrael. Hayachamish Meis Ama, Hayachamish Meis Ama, it was 500 cubits by 500 cubits, Hayam Mukab Chaima, and it had a wall around the 500 cubits. The Kefna Gaba Kefna Yabnuyas, Mitakto. There were arches, one, on top of others, the oil to prevent the ritual impurity because of Tumas oil, because of if there was any one buried there, it should not ascend the Tuma, it should be contained. It was covered one colonnade inside another. So there were colonnades in the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount had benches. You were able to sit there. It also had a rooftop to it. So you were able to, it was open. But it had colonnades. It was like a portico where you were able to sit under the roof or the shade. And uh, in case of rain, you were able to, to be under the, the, the roof cover. Now, Base, take one more. Hamisha, Sha'olim Hayaloi, it had five entrances, five gates. Bechad mina Mayrev, one on the western side. Bechad mina Mizrach, one on the eastern side. Bechad mina Tzofen, and one on the northern side. Shnai mina Dorev, and two were on the southern side. Bechad Kolshar Esa Ames, the width of every gateway was 10 cubits. The Gobay Essim, the height was 20, the Ishlam Pelosis, and it had doors. The, uh, so we're speaking about cubits. 
10 cubits was about approximately 15, 15 feet wide and um, about 30 feet tall. That was the entranceway. Uh, they all had names. I guess we'll cover that next time. Each of these gates had a name to it, a special significance. And the southern side had two gates, which were called the gates of Chulda. And uh, different reasons given. One of them is that Chulda was one of the Nevi'is, one of the prophetess. And she would sit between the two gates and people would come and uh, ask her as a prophetess, she would give the, the answers to their questions. And since she would, now also this is the side that was closest to the city that most people that came, the city was on the Southern side of the base of Mikdash, of the Temple Mount. So therefore the majority of people that came, they would, enter, they would come through the Southern side. Therefore there were two gates over there. So, um, so we will stop here. And please keep all the handouts if you want to. Make it easier to. Yeah. Yes. Where does it say that Har Hamaria means from where the teachings come out? Place from where the teachings come out? Um, that's um, the source of that. Uh, let's see. I'll tell you the source. Um, I would have to uh, find the exact source um, because the it's called Shem Tetzayeva because the Mishkas Agassiz was there, situated in the Anhara Bayis, and uh, that was the Supreme Court was there, and all the teaching came from Mishkas Agassiz from the Sanhedrin Agdala. Therefore, this is also by Rio comes Lashon Hayva, which means teachings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good. Uh, Esther. Mm -hmm.